All right. Um, it's seven o'clock now, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us for Fourth Tuesday Photography. This month we have um, Jim Griggs, um, who many of you know, um, and he's going to talk about a program titled Think Before You Shoot. Uh, before I turn it over to Jim, I just wanted to, yes, the legend, as Sean said, I just wanted to um, uh, put in a few plugs for stuff that's coming up at the library. The day after tomorrow at the 7 p.m., same time as this, we're having an event called Books and Tea, which is the, the online version of Books and Beans that, um, that we've done in years past with, it's kind of a collaboration between Newton Public Library, Heston Public Library, and Mojo's Coffee Shop. Um, and so it's online this, this time. Um, hopefully next, next summer when we do it again, we'll be back at Mojo's, which is a great environment. But um, basically it's gonna be our director, Dr. Kerry Cusick, and um, uh, someone from Heston Public Library, and then some community volunteers have all prepared little book talks about um, what they're reading, what they're interested in reading, and it's just going to be a fun kind of casual time of, um, of sharing books with each other and maybe getting some great ideas for what to read. And also, um, if you um, participate or plan to participate, you can stop by Mojo's and pick up a free uh, tea sampler and brew yourself some great tea to sip while you enjoy the program. So yeah, I encourage you to do that. Um, you know, first, first come, first served on the free tea from Mojo's. Um, I will say this month's Fourth Tuesday program is going to be with Fernando Salazar, who um, I think will have a really interesting perspective um, as a career-long photojournalist. Um, he just recently um, wrapped up more than 30 years with the Wichita Eagle and is now doing um, independent and freelance photography. Um, so I can't wait to, to kind of pick his brain about, about that, that kind of photography in his career. Um, I guess that's, that's probably enough. I, I would uh, encourage you to take a look at our Facebook page, um, go to our website, newtonplks.org, and um, get signed up for our email newsletter if you haven't already, and that will have all the great stuff that's happening at the library. Um, and now, I one more thing I would say, um, you know, this is, um, I think we're planning to have Q&A at the end, but, you know, since we're online, feel free to th um, throw out whenever the urge strikes you, Type in the chat or use the Q&A function, and um, we will see see your questions or comments and thread them in at the at the appropriate time and uh, have it be interactive that way. So, um, Jim, um, I guess is a you know great photographer. Um, his work's on display at the at the public library right now. If you stop in, you can take a look look at it. Um, uh, photos from some of his overseas trips that are really awesome. And um, he's, uh, I, he just showed me that the, the Nature Conservancy, their annual report, he's got a bunch of cool photos that the Conservancy commissioned him to take that are in that report. And that's just uh, one example of many amazing uh, projects and partnerships and publications that he's been part of with, with his work. And I, you know, if you just go on and on about what a cool um, photographer and great guy he is. Um, but I will let Jim do some of that himself, maybe Jim and uh, go ahead and take it away. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now, right? Yes, please, yeah, yeah, yes. All right, one of the things I was gonna bring up is that we've, I've got a program coming up at the Cedars in McPherson at uh, 7 p.m. on July 8th, and it's, uh, about East African safaris. Uh, I've done a couple of, pro well, at least one program for them about safaris, but this one's a little different. I'm just gonna talk about things that have happened on our trips and it's comprised mostly of, of video. So as opposed to still photos. And I wanna say mostly videos are probably 70% of what I'm gonna show. And uh, we'll go from there. But I wanna talk a little bit about a topic that I call Think Before You Shoot, Pre-Visualization, the Age of Digital Blasting. And, and what I mean by digital blasting is I, I think about our first trip to Tanzania and we were shooting slide film, uh, 36 shots per roll, 120 rolls. We had 4,320 shots to last us for 12 days. And we were then we were done. That was all we could shoot. So with 
Now with digital devices, we sometimes shoot that many images in a day on location in Tanzania or Maxwell or, or wherever. It doesn't really matter where. We just shoot a lot more images than we used to. And there's a, a saying I've seen on the internet a lot says, does that amount of shooting make us better photographers? Maybe, but probably not. I think about the, in golf, since I play golf three days a week, the old saying was practice doesn't make perfect, only perfect practice makes perfect. So if you get you get really good at making bad photos, you can make a lot more of them really fast, unless you learn from your mistakes and, and figure out what you want to do. And, and I fell into that trap for probably eight or nine years. I shot a lot of stuff and I never was happy with any of it. And that's back in film days when it was expensive. And then I attended a week-long workshop with Boyd Norton. And it was an aha moment for me. I woke up and said, wow, the camera sees entirely different than my eyes do. I got to think like a camera. And that's sort of the starting point for, for what, I, what I do now in photography. We had, I really didn't have much of a camera. My very first camera, and I'll just hold it and show you this. This is it, a little 35 millimeter German rangefinder, no meter. Uh, it's a it, nothing in it that's all mechanical. It's a simple film camera, 35 millimeter, very good optics, fixed lens. You couldn't do anything but shoot whatever that lens would allow you to do. But I got it for a dirt cheap and I couldn't pass it up. I had a buddy who was in the, uh, he was working for the government. And he was sent to Vietnam for three months back in 1969. And uh, I said, while well, you're there, buy me a Nikon F because I'd used one of those in college. I really liked the Nikon F. Uh, he came back from a really harrowing three months in Vietnam with a 28 millimeter Canon lens. And I, uh, I didn't lens that I got from Vietnam. Still have it. Still, it still works. Everything's fine with it. But I felt like I was holding either a combination of poetry, pottery, and a fine watch, all rolled in one. That first SLR. So I only had one lens, 28 millimeter. But I dove in head first into photography, and I shot and shot and shot with that that 28. Now this picture is with a 50 millimeter, but I had a 28 wide angle lens. And so I, I kind of had read a lot of stuff and I always said I wanted to capture pictures, not just create, I want to create pictures, not just capture them. So I'd read some stuff from Ansel Adams and I got all excited about his, how he thought. And so uh, one year is like about 71 when I was on vacation. I was at the Great Sand Dunes National Monument with my first wife. I'm still married to her, but I just call her that. Um, the rains had cleared, it had been rainy, and the sand was wet on top. And I saw this real steep sand dune. I said, Just follow me and stay in my footsteps. And I stomped my way all the way down this hill, zigzagging back and forth. I got to the bottom, I said, you stand there and look back at the footprints. And I went out, took this shot with that 28 millimeter lens on that Canon FTQL using Tri-X black and white film. And I, I, won, uh, I won a Kenzo Award, Kodak International Newspaper Snapshot Award for that. And just, I thought, wow, that's really amazing. I actually did win something with that. But I only shot with that 28 millimeter. I mean, I kind of became an extremist. I had that 28 millimeter lens and the lack of having other lenses was, it forced me to do whatever I could do with that lens. And I bought a 200 millimeter after I made some money with photography. So I only had two lenses, a 28 and a 200. No, I didn't even own a zoom until 1999. So everything I had was fixed was a fixed focal length. So I did, I worked with those two lenses. And I learned what they did well. And it also taught me that I was an extremist in photography, which meant give me really wide or really tell a photo. And I don't use much in between. And it, the reason I use that is extreme ends of the focal length are where perspective is controlled, and exaggerated, or created. And it seems to that's how I see the world now. I see the world with either a big telephoto or with a real wide angle. And I, I don't do much in the middle unless it's something like I'm documenting, but I became sort of an extremist. It was also true with uh, in my photography with shutter speeds and apertures that early on, especially. I use either really fast shutter speeds or really slow shutter speeds, or I use extreme depth of field or extremely shallow depth of field. And it still resonates in my thought process as to how I think, but I shot with that 28 for about six months before I could afford a second lens, which was a 200. 
I'll just show you some examples here. This is out in at uh, Monument Rocks. My wife took this picture of me wandering around over there with the, the birds flying around, and I'm taking some pictures. But I had noticed down there on the foreground this these uh, little flowers called globe mallows. And I thought, man, that's, that's those are really gorgeous, and the light's just starting to get good on them. So I wandered over, put on my wide angle lens, I looked at it, I said, yeah, that would work. Now this band of flowers is only two feet from front to back, and I'm about sixty feet away from the uh, from the formations there. But if I got down really low with a really wide angle lens, nobody would know that that was only two feet of flowers. So this is from a real low angle with an extreme wide angle lens. This is a 14 millimeter, super wide. The flowers are no more than a half inch from the front of the lens, but it looks like the flowers go on quite a ways. And this is a horizontal that I shot. And I said, this would be much better as a vertical. So I turned it vertical and shot it this way as a vertical, which I like a lot better. But the flowers almost look like they go almost all the way to the to the to the formations. I left a little space at the top because I know that would make a good magazine cover. And they could put their type up there. In fact, it was a cover for Travel Kansas Magazine in, in 2019. Uh, in the old days, that cover would have sold for 400 to 800 dollars, maybe 1,200, depending on the magazine. Today, uh, top ends about 75 bucks for a cover cover shot. Just to show you how, how small that band of flowers was. This is me taking the shot. Cindy took this picture of me. And you can see how there's just not hardly any flowers at all in front of the camera. Very few there. But if you look back at the photo, it looked like they go on forever. And that's the perspective that I'm, I'm exaggerating with that, that super wide lens. How did I know I could do this? Well, the main reason is that I'd spent four months shooting with just one lens, a 28 millimeter wide angle. So, and I, I kept saying, I wish I had more. I ended up buying a, a 20 millimeter, one 24 and then a 20, and then a 16 and then a 14, but I just keep getting wider and wider. But I knew what I could do with that lens. I knew I, how I could make it work for me and and where, I, where it didn't work really well. Once I got really, really to the point that I understood the 28, I went out in the shop with just a 200. And then I could learn what the 200 would do, and I could shoot uh, more or less the same thing that I, so that I understood how the lens angle affected the perspective of the scene and how I could control it. Now let's move on to another little topic that I call serendipity. If you're going to work for a magazine or something, or you're going to do an assignment, they're not going to send you out and pay your way, hoping that something happens in front of your lens. They want you to do a little research and understanding and basically pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, to come back with images that they can use that are, fit their assignment and what their vision of what they wanted to see. So I, I think serendipity is something I mean, I don't consider serendipity, I consider it a discovery mode for me when I go out and use all those extreme lenses, let me recognize an opportunity when I find it. A typical example would be this hippo in a pool in, uh, in Gorongora Crater. And I, I just sat there and watched him. And every 10 to 15, about, probably about 10, 12 seconds, he would come up, get a breath of air, go back down. 12 seconds later, he'd come back up, and as he's getting a breath of air, he'd flip one ear and make a big splash. Go back down, come up 12 seconds later, get a breath of air. Go down, come back up 12 seconds later, get a breath of air, and flip his ear. So as every other time he'd flip his ear, and I watched this for about a minute and a half, and I said, okay, now I know to time it. And I just set my camera and got ready. He always came up in the same spot, and I got the shot I wanted. The ear flipping so it's a matter of paying close attention and 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 looking at behavior and and anticipating what he's going to do uh, another way that i control is like shooting the milky way i've got an app on my phone called sky safari and it lets me pull up on the sky and see what's going to be up there anytime in 24 hour day or for months and years in advance actually but I can see what I could see where the Milky Way was going to be above this cabin at our workshop in Wyoming. And it was about 11 p.m. that it would be directly above that cabin from where we had this clearing to shoot from. So I told everybody we'd meet out there at 10:30 and get ready and we'd get our tripod set up and shoot the Milky Way. And so we got out there and everybody said, How'd you know it was going to be there? Well, so I got this app explaining about how that works. So we shot this. There was actually a lady there, uh, 
from England who had never seen the Milky Way. I don't think she'd ever seen stars, to be honest with you, knowing about England, but she had a Canon Rebel with the kit lens on it. And I stayed there with her until she got some really decent shots of the Milky Way. She was thrilled, could hardly wait to get back and show her friends in England what the Milky Way looked like because nobody there has ever seen it. Uh, another night shot, this is at uh, Carhenge in Nebraska. So the, the town of, of um, Alliance, which is really close, provides a lot of the light that's already there lighting up the sides of the cars and the, providing the silhouettes of the ones in the background. Um, I was a little concerned about clouds. They, they kind of ruined flower, pick, taking pictures of, of uh, the stars. But these, flower, these clouds were moving pretty fast. And I remember from shooting with when Jim Richardson and I were experimenting with uh, digital stuff and doing night shooting about what shutter speed I need for these speed of clouds to get this kind of bored look to them. And so I, I chose that, that uh, shutter speed and then adjusted f-stops and ISO to get the exposure I wanted. And I used a little uh, flashlight in here. This is the flashlight I was using. I don't know if you can see this, but it's a it's just a little LED flashlight. And I did the painting on the cars so they'd be lit up on this side. Otherwise, they'd be pure black and you couldn't really tell much about them. So that's another thing where I knew exactly what I wanted, knew where I needed to be. And I looked at which way the light was coming from and planned it out. Thunderstorm in Serengeti in, in, in Tanzania. And this is a dying thunderstorm. It's got some bands of rain going on. I took this shot because I really liked it. It's 100 millimeter on a 100 to 400 zoom lens. And, but I, the part that intrigued me the most is right down here in this corner, the little, the little hill and the tree and the, the lights and everything there. So I, I'm just looking at it. I said, okay, that's 400 millimeters. So I zoomed in at 400 and I took this shot and I got the, the simplicity I was looking to create. Now the, the tree says Africa, the light says sunset, the bands over here said rain coming down. So I, I got what I wanted. And again, it's since I've been shooting so much, I know what 400 millimeter looks like. I know what 20 millimeter looks like. So I can pre-visualize most of this stuff before I shoot it. I know what lens I need. I don't fumble around changing lenses trying to get to the one I need. It's it's uh, one of the joys of being an old old guy, I guess. Well, look at, uh, everybody says you're gonna go out and shoot the full moon tonight. Well, no, I usually don't, unless I need the moon for something else. But. Not, I don't generally go out and shoot the full moon. I shoot the day before the full moon. The reason is you know, when the full moon comes up, it's coming up just as the sun goes down. The sky is black. You, you get nothing. But if you shoot the day before the full moon, this moon comes up early enough, you still have some light in the sky. You may have some colorful clouds or something to go with it. So I never shoot. I, I shouldn't say never. I rarely shoot the full moon, um, except unless I need it for something. Now, I did shoot a night shot of the moon because I needed it for this shot. This is for my grandson. I built him a, a uh, Saturn V Estes rocket and he wanted a gantry tower. So I got an old erector set that I had when I was 10 years old. I found it in the barn down in Oklahoma and I brought it up here and made him a gantry tower that we can mount the thing on and, and launch from. But I wanted the moon in that one photo there and I lit this up with flashlights and, and uh, down in the little studio I've got. I would go out for the moon, if there, I could put something in front of it that, that would be intriguing. This is the day before the full moon. I went to Quivera and uh, was awarded with a, a bunch of birds landing on this, this limb, these limbs, and flying around. And I got the, the moon with the birds in front of it. And that's, again, I'll go out and shoot if there's something that's going to be in front of the moon that, that looks good. The moon's not even in focus. But you can, I got enough of it in focus, you can tell what what it is. It is the moon, not just a, a light area. Also went to Corvera to, uh, I also went out to uh, to Bosque del Apache because I wanted, for the day before the full moon, I wanted to be there, try and catch sandhill cranes flying in front of the moon. When you know what, I get all set up, the cranes would come and they'd turn left, they'd turn right, they'd go up, they'd go down. They never went in front of the moon. I spent 45 minutes waiting for them to get there. Finally, one group, this group came across, flew in front of the moon. I got a couple of shots that I wanted. Passed up some good shots. But when you're doing this stuff and you got your mindset on doing this, you, you know, it takes a lot of patience to pass up 
other good things going on somewhere else. You'd hate to look away because then I know if, as soon as I turned around and looked the other way, say fly, somebody fly in front of the moon. And, I, and it was either that night or not at all because the next night by the time the moon got up where the birds were flying, the sky would be black and the birds wouldn't show up. So I quit that. I fortunately got the shot I wanted. Talk a little bit about tripods and I don't know how many people have tripods, but my, my key advice there is don't waste money on cheap ones. Um, make sure you bite the bullet and get a, a fairly good tripod. The most important thing is it's sturdy, rock sturdy. It's solid. Uh, you want it so that it'll hold the camera up to your eye level, unless you're going to be sitting in a chair or something. But uh, I like having a, a good solid tripod. Now, I will tell you that that's Jim Richardson. We were shooting on his assignment for Geographic, which lasted nine months. I got to help him for nine months. It was a lot of fun. They work well to hold the camera up there. They hold it very steady. And this is at Bosque del Apache, and there's a group of people here that extend about 75, 80 yards one direction, 75, 80 yards the other direction from me. I was going to estimate about a million dollars worth of cameras and lenses and tripods in this one photo. But um, you notice that they're all at eye level, except for the person in the chair that's sitting down there lower. Everybody's standing up to get the, the tripod holding at eye level. If you think about People walking around with their phones, taking pictures, people holding the cameras, taking pictures. Everything's taken about five feet off the ground. The tripod level, handheld level, standing up. And, and what I'm leading up to is I, I did a, a class here in McPherson years ago on, uh, on photography. And everybody wanted a little outing. So we went out to Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. I wanted to go out there because I wanted to get some pictures of the, the ranch house. They had just painted the roof. It was all red. It was gorgeous. So we went out there and everybody, we went out by the road, we're taking pictures of the ranch house. And I looked around, everybody had their tripods set up and everybody's standing up right there behind their tripods. And I just kind of asked, where are we? And they said, well, I said, where are we taking pictures of? They said, ranch house. I said, where? where? Where is this? What's the name of this place? They looked at me like I was a nut and said, it's uh, tall grass prairie. I said, really, how tall does the grass look through your camera? And they all looked and said, wow, not very tall at all. I said, lower your tripods. So everybody starts lowering their tripods. You could almost hear them say, wow, in unison, because now all of a sudden we're at the tall grass prairie and the grass is tall. So you, you got to think about what am I trying to show or depict in the photo I'm taking? I'm trying to show the tall grass prairie and the ranch house is located on the tall grass prairie. So I get the tripod down low, I get the tall grass. That's, a, again, think before you pull the trigger. Um, this is a using a, a tripod that's down really low and getting, getting a low shot. This is a lady got nicknamed Bigfoot, taking some pictures down low with her tripod down low. This lady, I'm not sure what was going on here, but she just was taking pictures under her tripod. <laughs> uh, she warned me if I ever showed this to anybody else, she was going to kill me. But uh, I can safely say that she passed away about five years ago. So I think my life's OK. I'm not endangered at all. All right, uh, I want to talk for a second about this digital blasting. I, this little camera I showed you, that the, I guess people can see me here, I'm not sure. But it's, uh, it's, only, it's very slow to shoot. It's like shooting a view camera. Everything is very slow. This is the Canon that I had that I could shoot a 36 exposure roll in about a minute if I was very handy. This is what I'm shooting now. This is a little Olympus, and it'll shoot 60 frames a second in silent mode, high speed. And so that's digital blasting I was going to mention. You can blast through a whole lot of shots with these, you know, 64 gig cards and, and shoot up a lot of stuff. But you need to slow down, think about what, what you're shooting, what you want to do. This is again at Bosque, and I, I was standing there waiting for the sun to go down. And there's a hillside behind us, but there's some clouds above the hill. And I can see the reflection of the clouds in the water here with the birds. And I said, when the sun goes down, that's, those, that cloud's going to light up. And the birds will just stand there. We're just milling around the same area. So I waited in that one spot. No birds to the right, no birds to the left. I had the ideal spot. As soon as the clouds lit up, I had this perfect shot. And I started shooting and shooting. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I looked to the right of me. 
there's a lens sticking over my shoulder, a lens to the left of me, there's lens down by my waist. There's lenses everywhere all around me because I was in the only spot that had birds with this beautiful colorful water. Uh, the only place I didn't see a lens poking through was between my legs. If they had, I would have clamped my legs and claimed it. But uh, I had everybody all around me. I had, the, I had the primo position for that. This is at, at Coronado Heights one evening, and a friend of mine was up there with this group from uh, McPherson College. And they're all standing on this dam, and he's down below shooting up with a wide angle lens, but the clouds above, well, nice. But people shooting upright with a wide angle lens it distorts people they look like they're 38 feet tall with huge legs and small heads i went way back over here with a 300 millimeter and took this shot because it, it more conveyed what i thought it should look like a portrait of people standing there with this fantastic background and i i did see his picture it was okay you know honestly i like this one a lot better there's another thing that i do that you have to think about what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. It's called thematic shooting. And the, the theme here is Lower Fox Creek School, which is located at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. It was built in 1882, and it's a really neat one-room schoolhouse. But I, I photographed it probably 20, 30 times. Every time I go by it, heading that way, I'll swing by to see if the light's good and what it looks like. And I, I've shot from several different angles. I've been out there in all the seasons. This is in winter. There was a tree out there that's in front of the of the schoolhouse, and I just kind of like the way the snow pounded into the into the uh, bark, kind of mimicked the snow that's all around the building, and it just kind of tied the two together, the tree and the and the schoolhouse. And then I noticed the same thing in the summer. Use that same tree in the shadow of that tree to lead you from the tree over to the to the schoolhouse. Same thing with some flowers that grow there. You can get down low and photograph the flowers out of the school in the background, or you can make the flowers a subject and the school out of focus. And there again, another magazine cover potentially, because it's soft up there, they can put their print over the top of that pretty easily. And I've got probably hundreds of other photos of this, those are the only ones I wanted to show. If you get a chance to go out there if, and it's open, going inside is really a pretty cool event. This is a little pano I did with my iPhone. But I think my all time favorite shot, of, I was out there with uh, Dwayne Graham, who a lot of you know, who used to live in Heston, while now lives in Newton. And uh, we had this kind of really cool sunset going on. This is a shot I took of that sunset, or one of maybe 15 or 20 that I took. All right, we'll switch gears and we'll run over to Africa again. This is a uh, a group of four zebra out in this prairie. And uh, each side of them are copies, which are piles of rock, like you see the lions at the zoo. And literally there were lions on those two piles of rock on each side of them. They were pretty wary of that. And everybody's taking pictures of the zebras here, getting close-ups of them and all that. And I turned my camera vertical and shot this with the clouds above in the skies. Sitting next to me was a lady by the name of, well, I won't even tell her her name, but she's from Colorado. And she looked at the back of my camera and said, well, that's really cool. How did you know to turn it vertical and get all that sky up there? And I just looked at her and said, you're not from Kansas, are you? And uh, she smiled real big and said, I understand. Because Kansas is, to me, is all about the skies and the, and what's here. You know, we don't have, the big, we don't have big mountains or anything like that in Colorado. We have to do things with our clouds and with our skies to, to make good shots things that are memorable. And so I did it in Tanzania because it looks like Kansas to me. This is a lighthouse that we got a tour of in uh, Oregon. The guy that's given the tour used to be the lighthouse manager, keeper, like it, housekeeper. And he was pretty shy about having a camera stuck in his face. So every time I get it, try to take a picture of him, he'd turn away. So I put on a wide angle lens and act like I'm taking a picture of the, the lights, the Fresnel lens. And I got him in it. And it kind of ties him to the, this is the, Lighthouse, this is the guy that used to work there. And it was the one image I wanted that kind of tied everything together. Going down the stairs, use that same super wide angle lens, and I looked. The one thing about it, it's really cool. I'm looking straight ahead at the stairs I just kept starting down, and at the top of the frame, I can see looking straight up. So that wide angle lens gives you a huge, huge uh, difference in perspective. And I was going to explain why that is. 
can people see me still on the screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'll just I'll just show you. Yeah. Um, okay. If I've got a wide angle photo here, and and I I'm looking at it here, and it, I can see like I'm looking at that, I can see that straight up and straight out at the same time. Right. Took you off. Oh, I sorry. I yeah, Jim. I I turned off your your share so that they could see you if you're demonstrating. Okay. And then can you turn it back on? Okay. Well, anyway. Back to, yeah. All right. If I've got a wide if I've got a wide angle screen, a uh, wide angle picture, I'll look at it here. It looks like that. I'm seeing straight up here, and I'm str straight up here, and I'm seeing straight across there, and it looks distorted. But if you take that same picture and move it up here close to your face, you have to look tilt your head to look at it. It looks normal. So when people say wide angle is, is wide angle is distort, well, no, wide angles show you a perspective that you can't see with your naked eye without getting up close to it and tilting your head. Then it looks normal to you. So I just that's a point I wanted to make about wide angle lenses. That it's it's how you look at it determines how wide angle it is. Do I need to do the share screen share? Or? Yeah, if you would turn that back on. Sorry, I thought that <laughs> I thought I was being helpful, but, <laughs> but hopefully you see if I can get back onto problem. it here. Now I gotta hit play again. So it should be, okay, we're in the same spot again. So here's another schoolhouse in, in uh, Kansas. And some people have probably seen, a lot of people here have seen it. And when you do shoot square on, I used a, the slight telephoto lens here, but I got the shot that I wanted. It's kind of nice, but it has no perspective to it, no depth, it's just flat, except for the fact there's a fence in the foreground in the house or the uh, schoolhouse. If you move up and use a slight wide angle lens, now you got perspective. You got leading lines that all converge to a point somewhere out there at infinity. And it's got depth to it. The building has depth. And I'm controlling how it appears. Now, that comes in handy. And I've, I've used this example before. I took this shot with a uh, 100 millimeter, 125 millimeter, 135 telephoto lens. And you see the little windmill down there and the wind turbine. That, that little windmill, takes it's about one fifth the height of that wind turbine. But if I drive up close and I put on a wide angle lens, now all of a sudden the windmill doesn't look so small. It's, it's basically half the height of the wind turbine in this shot. And so uh, photographs don't lie, but photographers do by controlling perspective and how you see it. Uh, we, I can change how it appears to you. I mean, this is again, pre-visualization, thinking about what you want to do with the photo and how you're going to convey it. Here's another uh, shot. This is a uh, bedrock where a glacier has been traveling across, scratching it up. Now the trail is on the other side of these rocks and looking from that side with the way the sun is shining, you don't see these grooves. So I had to go around the other side so I wanted the grooves to show up as you know when, when you light it up from the side, it, the grooves didn't really stand out as shadows. So you can see the grooves of the rock underneath the glacier has been dragging across the bedrock and scratching it up. Another shot, this is a bird called a uh, black winged stilt. It's on a little pool of water, maybe a 30 acre pond in Serengeti. And, uh, but he wouldn't stand still and I had a few ripples, but it just, it, when I first got there, it just looked like clouds and the bird came in for me and wandered around. It just looked like the bird was walking among the clouds. So a kind of a, a, a shot that I really wanted to do, it, it just happened to look like what I wanted to do. So I shot it. Here's another one with a sun going down through that, again at Monument Rocks. And I would position myself so that when the sun broke through that corner, I could shoot with a very small lens opening, F16, get everything in focus. I could get the fraction rays off the sun and I could light up the grass in the foreground. So the grass pops and, and really shows up really well. So again, kind of pre-visualize what I want it to look like. And I shot it and it actually worked better than I thought it would. So uh, that was a, a pretty cool evening to be out there for sunset. Again, back at Bosque del Apache is the most vivid uh, rainbow I've ever seen in my life. And, and it's cool to see shoot the rainbow, but I got all these snow geese flying across in front of it. So I grabbed my 600 millimeter and I took this shot of the snow geese flying in front of the, of the rainbow. I don't know if they fly in front of it and back of it or through the middle of it. I, I can't, haven't figured that out yet, but somebody that's uh, better at physics can explain it to you. But I just, that's the shot I visualized was these birds flying through this rainbow of color and, and it turned out pretty nice. It's a good thing they weren't 
uh, sandhill cranes because they wouldn't show up as well, but white birds, I'm glad they were snow geese. Go back to a little extremism here. This is again flowers. This shot with a 300 millimeter lens and I shot wide open. I didn't stop down a bit. I'm shooting wide open and, and you can't really pre-visualize this look at it, but if you if you've done it before, you can pre-visualize, but you can't look at it and say, I know what this is going to look like unless you've done it. So I use a 300 millimeter. I'm, the only thing I'm focused on is that flower and only in a, one plane of that flower. And I keep moving around until I get the background that I want that matches up the color I want and to make the flower pop out. And so I, I spent a, a little bit of time moving left and right and back and forth and trying to get the, the colors in the background that I wanted. So that's using very shallow depth of field and pre-visualizing how it's going to turn out because I've done it a lot. You can't visually see that because your eye has great depth of field because it changes f-stops and it changes focus point and your brain builds it all together. The camera only captures that level, whatever's in focus there when it's wide open. Um, I don't know if Jeff's on here or not. Jeff Heidel and I were out at Maxwell snowing and I had a pretty fast shutter speed because I was afraid I'd blur the bison and, and he wasn't moving too much. He was just standing there, but I shot this. It looks cold, right? With the snow coming down. I said, you know, it looked colder if it was windy. So I went to a pretty slow shutter speed and I shot it again with a slow shutter speed. Now that looks like it's windy. That looks colder to me than that shot. This looked cold before, this looks colder. Because now you got this blowing snow, it just makes you want to bundle up a little more. Here's another crazy shot, as long as we're at Maxwell. Uh, it looks like these two bison are butting heads and fighting over something. Actually, what they're doing, uh, the feed truck had just driven across this ridge, dropping range cubes. And one bison from the right was eating his way across, the other was eating his way across from the left. And they're a couple of feet apart, maybe five feet. And I timed it so I get a shot of them just as their heads got together. So it looks like they're fighting, but they're actually eating, going opposite directions and not in line with each other. But it's what I wanted to convey this, because they kind of got this lean to them and their heads are down and looks like they've got a fight going on. One of our early FYBO outings, we were going up and uh, these elk just all of a sudden appeared up on the ridge and I yelled for Betty, stop, stop. And she said, we can get closer. I said, no, we want to stop right here. So we all piled off the trams and shot this with telephoto lenses. And I, I wanted to get it before the color and that cloud went away. And it, uh, this isn't a panorama, it's just cropped. And I use digital scissors a lot in Lightroom to crop it to where it looks the way I want it to look, regardless of where it's eight by 10 or five by seven or whatever. I don't, those numbers don't mean anything to me. I want it to look the way I want it to look. So I, I just cropped this to get this long panorama look to it. And that's what I was after. Uh, when you see something, like, actually about 90 seconds later, and that color was gone in that cloud. It just became a cloud up there. This is out at the, the ranch in Wyoming and I was doing blur pans and that, you know how to do them. Sometimes I'll teach you, but we do it out at the workshop. We tell everybody how to do them and show them how to do it. And this gal's riding horseback, bareback, and her dog, she's got this dog that's uh, addicted to her. And that dog, you know, where she goes, that dog's right on her heels. So I had her run back and forth about 10 times, and I shot a lot to get one shot where both she and the dog were sharp. Um, out in the field, had her riding again. She's very sharp. Horse's legs are blurred. The background's blurred. I'll tell you one thing about, about this. I'm shooting a slow shutter speed. So, and I got an ISO that's pretty low. That means I gotta be shooting at like F11. Except for the fact that those trees are blurred from me panning, they would be sharp in this photo because I've got a lot of depth of field. And so focus is not all that critical. You just get it close to where she's gonna be and just shoot and pan with her and keep going. It's difficult, somebody on horseback or riding a bike or something because they're going up and down. Um, generally, especially on horses. Race cars, a lot easier. When they go by you, they're just moving. You just pan with them and shoot. And then this is out in Wyoming. I did this one for the class out there. This is blurred pans. It's not a blurred pan, but it's a blurred pans. Um, that was a joke. All right, we'll go on from there. Elephants, this is in, uh, again, in Serengeti. 
I've got a lot of pictures of elephants. This is a typical elephant shot. You got dirt all over him, mud that's dried out and and turned him white. Our guide was driving along one road and he, he stopped at elephant, elephant. And I stood up and this elephant came out of the bush and crossed the road in front of us right at sunset. It's that's a little better because it shows the elephant doing something, something happening. But if you've just got an elephant and you're taking a picture of an elephant, it's it's okay. But what's the thing that you really notice about elephants? They're massive, they're huge, right? So if you want to make anything look massive or huge, use a telephoto lens and get tight on them. So here's an elephant close up. And that, just tell me the difference. That's an elephant. This is an elephant, right? It's like with a capital E, it's just huge. It's right in your face and it dominates the screen. It fills the screen up. And, and you see the little green things at the bottom. That's some foliage there. I actually asked the driver, I just said, see mama, see mama, see mama top of dolly. That means stop, please. And so he stopped and I got the, the grass sticking up there. So I do that a lot now. I shoot through the grass, through the weeds, through limbs, through tree limb, uh, foliage. Again, an elephant. You can tell it's an elephant pretty quick from looking at it. You don't look at it and say, what is that? Is that some kind of a dog tooth or something? It's, you know, it's an elephant, it's the skin and the, and, the, and the tusk. Another one, elephant shot really done tight, uh, it's big, it's massive, it shows you that it's an elephant. And the other ones I do, I come back and do this, I do environmental shots. This is two elephants walking along at the, in the in Gorongora crater, and I it's shoot vertical, I get the crater as a background, you got a place for a title up there. Another shot in the crater, these are wildebeest, and that wall of the crater, with the crater is 10 miles in diameter, 2,000 feet deep, we're down in it, and you see how massive that wall is, how much it goes up. The black spots in the back lip, those are Cape Buffalo. Another wall shot, these, this is in Utah. And, and this is with a 400 millimeter lens. So I'm looking around, I see where I've got this contrast between the hard rock and the nice trees. Another one I did in uh, New Mexico, the, the, the rock and this tree somehow surviving coming out of the rocks. Um, I was in a blind and in, in, uh, Nebraska photographing sandhill cranes, none of them would come by. And all of a sudden the sun dropped out of there and I said, I gotta shoot this. I don't need any crane shots, I need this. So I shot this, begged for cranes, the sun went down and the cranes came in. I didn't get any shots of those. Uh, so a lot of times I'm going someplace with a goal in mind and something changes my mind. I was headed out to Teeter Rock and I saw this field of wheat and this fog that was on it. I drove down into it and I shot a couple of what I call landscape shots. And I started shooting detail shots. And I shot a lot more details and close-ups and the dew that's on all this stuff. And it sort of captured my imagination. I really like this stuff, doing it. And then I start seeing other things of the little water drops and this ladybug and then more water drops and another ladybug shot. So when, you know when you pick up a magazine, it's not just full of you know, magical landscapes. It's got details, it's got everything else in it. So that's what I try to do is tell the entire story of what's there without just a bunch of landscapes. Almost every shot I've seen of sunflower fields is shot at F-22 or F-16, so everything's in focus. I did just the opposite. I used a telephoto lens and shot it wide open because I only need the first flower in focus. And I got the first flower in focus. What's all that yellow stuff behind it? Your brain tells you what it is. It's sunflowers. I don't need to see all those back there. So that's like, this guy's, you don't have anything else to look at in this picture. You can't keep coming back to the one sunflower. I'm forcing you to look at that sunflower because you wander off, you come back. You wander off, you come back. So I'm controlling your eye. And the whole thing is I knew what it was gonna look like if I shot it this way, wide open. I'd have that one flower really sharp and the rest of it would be out of focus. Again, magazine cover, Kansas, sunflowers, glorious sunflowers. Uh, other times, knowing what lens you need and, and getting it done, we've been out photographing sunset in uh, Badlands National Park in South Dakota. Walked back into the parking lot, and this couple's getting on a motorcycle. The sun's going down. I told Cindy, set the tripod up now, set it up. She's throwing the tripod up. I grabbed a 600 millimeter, throw a body on it, throw it up on the tripod. I got three shots before they rode off. But again, it's, it's pre visualizing, know what lens I need. And, and work like hell to get it. Um, another one, this is in 
in Tanzania. And I'm coming out of the lodge, getting ready to get in the vehicles to go down in the crater. I'm looking 2,000 feet down into the Lorai forest. There's ground fog going on. There's light coming in. And I said, oh, my God. I grabbed my 100 400, went to 400 millimeter, and I'm kneeling down the ground using the rail to brace. And I'm shooting these pictures. Every single person came by me and said, what do you see? I said, the trees. Is it elephants? I said, no, the trees. You see lions down there? No, the trees. I kept telling people it's the trees. And everybody kept looking for wildlife because we're in Africa. We're supposed to shoot pictures of wildlife. I said, no, the trees. So at lunchtime, I'm going back chimping, you know, looking for pictures, going, ooh, ah, ah. And I'm scrolling through, and somebody said, oh, what, what was that? I said, the trees. That's what I was shooting up there. Man, you should have told us. I did. I told you the trees, but you didn't pay any attention. You're looking for wildlife. You know, you're here. Why pass up a shot like that? That's been sold so many times, it's unbelievable. It's hanging in, in the Ministry of Forestry's office in, in England, you know, big print of it. So um, another thing, when you see something and you just know it's good, do it, man. Grab everything and go for it. This is a Mount Edith Cavell in Jasper National Park. We're going, in, going into Jasper to eat. I look up and saw that. I grabbed my lens and ran out in the middle of the street, braced on a light pole, and shot this shot. We went in and ate, came back out. It looked like that. You know, which do you want? You want you want this or you want that? And I want the color. I like the color. Just that's a nice shot. But once you see the other one, that's garbage. The other one's so much better. Antelope Canyon. This is in Arizona. Dwayne Graham down in there. And I wanted something that, for scale, but I didn't want tourists one around. I needed another photographer. So I, Dwayne was shooting. He didn't know I did this. I shot this picture of him. Coming home from shooting high school seniors and I uh, looked at the sky and I, Cindy was driving and I said, quick, get me to the opera house right now. Get me there. She said, okay. She turns, she's going, I look at the speedometer. She's doing 35. I said, the speed limit is 35. I said, get me there quick. Go 45 or 50. She said, I'll get a ticket. So I'll pay for the ticket. She said, I might go to jail. I said, I might bail you out. If you don't go 45, I won't. So she drove me over there. As soon as we stopped, I hopped out of the vehicle. I started shooting before the car was stopped. We had this beautiful light. Everything's going on. The light reflecting on the windows. It's just, it was, and it's just the right time of day with the street lights coming on. And I got the shots that I wanted. This is actually, they use it for their brochures at the, at the opera house. Flamingos flying by. I had a whole bunch of flamingos at M Momoma Lakes. Momo Momoma Lakes, right? And they'd taken off and they were flying, but they weren't anywhere near us. They started spiraling out in the big circles flying by. And I got this shot. It's okay. Greater Flamingo. Here's another one with some other ones behind. Not the one I want, not the shot I wanted. I waited and waited. Finally, I got the shot I wanted with a bunch of them in formation coming by, like fighter planes. And I got, I got the, the ones that don't have the color or immature. And these are greater flamingos. They're, they're only white body. The lesser flamingos are pink all over. Uh, remember, I talked to you about low, using a low tripod or low angle shot. This is out at Tallgrass Prairie. I'm laying down with my 300 millimeter shooting sunset. There's the sunset I'm shooting through the, through the flowers and the color there. It's just kind of an interesting, spectacular shot. Again, I want to show that I'm down low. If you want your picture to look different, get up high or get down low. This is a hot air balloon ride I bought for my wife for her birthday. We're out in this hot air balloon. You couldn't tell we were in a hot air balloon until I found the shadow of the hot air balloon in the background. So I got that shot. Now you say, oh yeah, we're in a hot air balloon. So you can see it. So I, I'm trying to, it looks like you're standing on a bridge or something. Otherwise, you know, it's a woven bridge out of who knows what bamboo or something. But another shot, I wanted the picture of the, uh, our courthouse with the, with the statue of the general there. It turns out they don't have lights on the statue of the general. So I got out there before sunset, set the tripod up, took one shot or a couple of shots as the sun was going down, got this nice glow on the statue. And then I waited until I got the blue hour when I could, I had sky, I had street lights on. I took another shot and I went into Photoshop and just moved the horse over here. Uh, so I got the sunset lights on the sunsetting light on the general, which wasn't available because they don't have lights on it for some reason. Maxwell wanted cards to give out. So I went, I went out there, one, one shot I took up purposely, I left a lot of space and I could make up this text for her. I went over to Walmart and got 100 images printed dirt cheap and, and they have them out there to give them away to people that come in. Again, 
it's preconceiving what you want to do and what you're going to do with it and leave space somewhere, um, shoot a bunch of different ways, crop it different ways, but but think about what you're going to do with it. I was in the in the Galapagos and we're down in the boat and I came upstairs. The light was horrible. I went back down and drank a little coffee. I came back up. It was spectacular. I'm glad I came up with a, lint, a camera both times. Had this beautiful sunrise going on. Finally broke through the clouds. Going out of the crater one night, uh, driving up the hill, and I noticed this tree. And I said, man, it's a beautiful tree. Too bad that it's so ugly in the sky tonight. But I looked around. I got some landmarks on the way down. The sky was beautiful going down the next morning. I just said, see mama stop top of dolly stop please so the driver stopped and i got this one shot very graphic a flat top acacia tree with a nice color in the background this is up in nebraska if you follow me on facebook you've already seen this too many times but it's uh what's called a broken continuum or a road something in the foreground disappears reappears smaller and reappears smaller a third time it's it's further away each time so it gets 3d feeling to the photo and, and it's a crazy road. It's a two-way two road, but it's only one lane wide. So if you go up there, it's fairly terrifying to go over some of these hills. You don't know if you're going to meet anybody or not. Back up in Jasper or Waterfall, and I just took this shot of the overall thing. It's uh, uh, This is uh, Sun Wapta Falls. But the thing I really liked was that one rock there. So I walked down there, put a telephoto lens on, I got this shot of the water cascading around that rock. Slow shutter speed. I like that the look it gives you with the water. This is another trail that we hiked up in uh, Oregon. This is uh, Sweetwater Creek. And there's little waterfalls like this for two miles or a mile and a half on this trail. And you can just spend three days hiking and photographing here. Spectacular, slow shutter speed. Uh, don't do it in the middle of the day. Sun shines in there and the it's spotty light It's horrible. But in the afternoon, early morning, it's really good. Um, grab shot. We were in Peru and stopped at the, uh, our boat stops and we'd sign in. That's Bob Gress. And I uh, just like this because he had a life preserver and he's getting ready to go to the bathroom. And I just thought, what kind of coincidence is that, that Bob would wear a life preserver to the bathroom? But so I took it. To me, it's a funny shot. Remember, I talked about getting low and getting up high or get down low. Uh, if you want your pictures to look different than everybody else's, get down really low or get up high. This is in a Cessna flying over canyon lands in, in Utah. And we just rented a plane, we wanted to fly over it. And so we got the guy to go as early as he would go, which is like eight o'clock in the morning. We flew over and shot it from the air and it's spectacular from up there. It's kind of flat from down below. Or, and so you get a totally different perspective. We got a lot of these shots. The one thing that digital has done and it's extended your day for shooting. You used to, we'd shoot until the sun went down, you're through. I could not even see these birds. It was so dark. But I, I knew they were there. And when we pulled in, the black headlights lit them up. So I got up composed best I could of what I could see. And this was shot. It was almost totally dark. And I got the tree that's in Bosque del Apache. But it, having digital, it's, you know, when you had when I had the old film cameras, I'm shooting film, you were limited to how much you could shoot. Because at night, you couldn't shoot much other than star trails. So I got this shot. That's, that's like impossible. Uh, I got a couple more shots and we'll be through. This is a, uh, a great big uh, lighthouse out on the coast in California. And I just kind of like the, the leading lines of the fence and all that and the light and the directions coming again, sunset. People go to the mountains, they say, I'm going to the mountains. What kind of wide angle lens would I use? Said, Leave your wide angle lens at home. Get a telephoto. You want the mountains to look big? Stand way back and use a telephoto. They get massive. They come out right in your face. This is in Jasper National Park. The line, the layers in there because of the haze gives a lot of depth. And you got all these different layers, and the mountains are massive because I'm shooting with the 300 millimeter lens here. Um, this is out at uh, McPherson State Fishing Lake. Went out out there for afternoon and evening, and the sun was set. It was really nice, and shooting right into it was horrible. This is slide film. So I kind of swung over and all of a sudden the tree said, wow, I got something to balance the brightness over there with this tree there. So I just left the tree in and photographed it. Out in the Flint Hills, late afternoon, you get this night, nice color. This is right after a burn and then they had some rains and the grass is green, it looks like Ireland. You see all the rocks there. I just, the 
the textures that show up with the with the, the sunset and the shadows of the little hills is just amazing. Oregon again, super wide angle lens, down low, footprints. I told everybody stay back, don't anybody walk out there. I get this shot first. This is a, a lighthouse up in Minneapolis or in Minnesota. And it was, I was up there in the winter and I said, I got to get a picture of this. It's really cool. Lighthouse is on the right, the water is on the left. The front uh, fence lead, has the lines that lead you to the lighthouse. The other fence leads you back out to where the water should be. It's ice right now. It is water, it's just hard water. This is on top of the, uh, the hill right beside the dam at Chase, Chase County State Lake. We, I climbed up to the top for sunrise. As the sun comes up, I got all these layers of trees out there because you don't know it, there's fog there, but between the layers of trees are fields that are planted. But it looks like rows of hills, right? And I, I showed this to people and said, well, that's, that's where was that? That's in Kansas. Well, no, Kansas is flat. I said, no, it's not. This is Kansas. I took it in Kansas, so they don't believe me. Back up at Jasper, this is uh, Pac-Man eating an iceberg. But I, I, I really took this shot. I waited for the sun to shine on the iceberg. So I get this light shining through the back of it. So you can see the color that, that these things have. And they're spectacular aqua colors of these things. Um, I, when, I, when I see something I think is funny, I, I photograph it. This is, uh, I couldn't pass this up. Ford, Ford meets Ram, uh, Ram Tough. I just thought, you know, with the Dodge commercials and all that, Ford meets Ram Tough. Perfect. Uh, great little play on words. This is, uh, again, in Jasper. I wanted the reflection. I wanted the rocks in the background. Background. It's a wide angle lens, tilted slightly down, not too much because then the trees splay, but I got the trees on one side, the mountain on the other side, and Mount, I forgot the name, but I think it's Mitchell in the background. And uh, I just moved around until I got where I wanted, a few feet, no, sorry, a few meters. One, I mean, in Canada, we got talking meters. I had to move a few meters one way or the other to get the shot that I wanted, but it, I finally got it. Uh, I could use a polarizing filter. You can see down through the water better, but you'd lose a reflection. So I, I didn't use a polarizing filter for that. One last shot, and then I'll be quiet. This is a uh, ice storm here in McPherson. And I waited till the storm was over and the sun came out because I knew that shooting almost wide open, any sparkly things in the background are gonna give me these, these uh, basic prismatic effects coming off the water drops of the ice. And I, so I shot this, the blue is the sky that's above. And uh, I just like those prismatic effects. They're shot with a 100 to 400, basically wide open. And uh, how do I stop share? Maybe you can stop it. Yeah. Wow. Um, I went you. fast, but I covered a lot of ground. Yeah, uh, that's... Um amazing photos and also a lot to think about and uh yeah pre-visualization that's a, a term i'll have to add to my uh photographer vocabulary for sure um it's, it's so it's open to questions yeah questions if you, you guys can uh type in the chat or, or on zoom you can use the q a um also those of you on zoom if you want to uh ask a question verbally just say so in the chat and i'll turn your microphone on um, one, one thing I wanted to ask was, um, when, uh, the, those, uh, those kind of landscape shots with the elephants that show the, it's pronounced Ngorongo crater, right? That, Ngorongo crater, right. Ngor yeah. Yeah. Don't what, try, don't try to spell it. Yeah. What an amazing, um, landscape. Can you, can you kind of describe what it's like to be in that crater? I, I feel like I've never seen anything like it, you know? It's, it's the Garden of Eden. There's 58,000 roughly animals in there. It's uh, self-contained. There's animals that never leave. There's prides of lions that have been there since who knows how long. Um, it's a volcanic crater. It's the largest unbroken caldera in the world. And it's, uh, it's all collapsed and down inside. It's, um, well, yeah, Jeff just said it's the most amazing place I've ever been. It, it's just incredible. When you walk up the edge of it and you just look down in it from that viewpoint, it just takes takes your breath away. You go, we got to get down there, you know. And and you look, you don't see anything. All of a sudden, you get a big lens. You look, there's animals everywhere down there, and they're just they're grazing and they're uh, hunting each other. You know, the predators out hunting the 
the uh, the grazers. It's it's a it's an incredible place to be, and it's it's self self contained. The only thing that you won't find down there that you find in the, the, that part of East Africa, you don't find impala because they don't have the, the forest that they hide out in, and you don't see any giraffes because they've never survived the descent, had too much blood pressure in her in her heads. So they're not down there, but you see almost everything. You see everything else. We've seen cheetahs. We've seen lions. Um, I've seen one leopard there. Hippos. Yeah. Hippos. Uh, you name it. Uh, rhinos. Rhinos. It's one of the few places you'll see rhinos, and yeah, yeah. you're almost guaranteed to see black rhinos. Um, so it's, it's, it's an amazing place. Yeah, that's and having a, that wall for a backdrop is is really crazy. It's just fantastic yeah it's like even though you can't see the whole in that photo that's what really struck me even though you can't see the whole crater of course you look at that that wall of trees and it's like whoa i've that doesn't you know that doesn't look like a, a glacial moraine or something you know you can tell that it's a different geological formation um so that's pretty that's pretty cool um it's, it totally takes people's breaths away, breaths away i'm serious it's crazy yeah, it, kind of a, a different. I, do you, um, you know, on the more recent smartphones, they've like, if you can see here, my, it's got these, um, it's got two different, um, you know, lenses there, and so you can kind of toggle between a, well, they, they, yeah, you got the same one. So I guess just, um, you know, you talking about using the wide angle versus the regular. I guess that would also apply to people taking and you, you know you can just press this button to toggle it um, between the two different types of lens yeah, you can also zoom it right and then yeah, it's got the digital zoom so i guess that's something maybe for you know for people that there are mobile phone photographers to think about yeah. shifting the between those settings it's also got it's also got a portrait mode have you played with that a little bit, yeah, yeah, and that like that's amazing because it uses, so it uses the its computer, I guess, to kind of simulate that effect, right? Well, depth the field, right? Yeah. yeah, it basically takes whatever you're you're saying the subject is, puts everything out, else out of focus. It won't give you the the uh, prismatic effect that you get with a telephoto lens and shooting wide open because it's not it's shooting stop down, and then it just blurs everything else. It does it. In, in the in the computer part yeah yeah um well does anybody else have um some uh questions for jim um if not we can uh yeah jim again it's uh it's just so inspired yeah what were you saying i was just going to say that if you really want to see something see africa what it's like uh, i've got some not only have i got the pictures for that We've done in the video we've done there. I got some pictures that Jeff took from uh, from Tanzania. That, that he's a, he was in a unique position to get the shots that I couldn't get, mm -hmm. and they're going to be in that program. So, yeah, were you doing it? Were you in, were you two there together? Uh, I forced Jeff to go. Mm -hmm. at, you know, at camera point, <laughs> and. Uh, it, uh, he, he'll tell you it was probably the most amazing, uh, amazing experience he's had. Yeah, that that's awesome. Um, definitely a definitely a bucket list item type of thing. Um, I don't. Are there any are there any places um, left on your list that you'd like to travel to? I mean, I, I think New Zealand's gotten a lot more popular um, as a destination. Any any places like that that you haven't been that you'd like to to get to to, to go on a photo trip um you know there's i'd like to go back to russia i like i've been in, i was in moscow once years ago with mm -hmm. film and i'd like to go back with, with digital and and shoot more of russia i thought it was a very amazing huge of course it's a huge country you know it's like somebody coming here and say well i don't need to go to see the rest of the u.s i was in chicago right now you didn't see the u.s you saw chicago i saw moscow i didn't see russia but from the countryside of Russia, I'd like to go see it. I'd like to go see Siberia. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, there's parts of Australia I'd like to see. The problem with going to Australia, I'd have to be there for three years in order to see it all. You know, I want, I want to see it all. I don't want to see, I don't care anything about towns. <laughs> it's, 
just not not my forte. I want to be away from people and out in the wild somewhere. Yeah. Um, Mar Marianne uh, typed a question. She she wrote um, with wide angle with wide angle lenses. How do you keep it sharp in in the foreground? I think is what she was asking. Very small lens opening. Yep. And focus. You don't focus all the way to infinity. You focus like one third into the shot and two thirds behind it, and that gives you the maximum depth of field. I'm shooting at f16. Some cases I'm shooting f22 if I have to. But you start getting to some a little bit of softening with diffraction, but not much. And, and uh, it also helps. I've gone to these these smaller cameras, this Olympus Micro Four Thirds, and they just the fact that it's a smaller uh, sensor, you get an inherent greater depth of field, which which is a, a blessing and a, and a curse. Because if you're doing portrait work, you want the background to be soft. You're shooting some of the flowers, you want the background to be soft. It's a little more difficult with this, but not much. Not enough that I'm going to go back to carrying big, heavy cameras and carry, and carry two of these and lenses that go from 14 millimeter to 800 millimeter in, in, in a shoulder bag. And I can carry it without having to give it to my wife <laughs> for her to carry. So. Yeah, cool. Well, um, I uh, thank you again, and um, and uh, yeah, this will be this will be up on our up on our YouTube channel if you want to go back and and look again at some of these photos that that Jim went through. Um, Jim, really appreciate it. Um, thanks thanks for what you do and and for being part of our uh, our fourth Tuesday group here. And um, sure. yeah, everybody hope to see you back uh, next month with Fernando Salazar. And in the meantime, you can go on our go on our fourth Tuesday Facebook group and uh, share your photos and chat about photography. And that'll be uh, it's always fun to do that as well. So I'll just uh, sign us off now. Bye, Jim. Right, Bye. Thanks. Thanks. See you guys.